Let's welcome Ryan Omario back from across the pond. Three weeks was long enough to be in Italy. So we are so glad that he's back. And Reverend Richard is a little under the weather. So he partied a little too hard, if you're watching, um, on his beach vacation. Not really. A lot of people have the, the respiratory crud, but we're holding him. And we said, stay home. Between Avril and I, we've got this. So you're in good hands with us today. And it's actually a fitting topic because uh, Avril's going to be talking about true healing and wholeness. So to that end, we're going to dra um, drag out an old Karen Drucker song. So if you're aware, it's called I'm Healed, Whole, and Healthy. So on your feet, if you're healthy enough and able and willing to be on your feet, and let's keep that energy in our heart that we, no matter what's going on on the outside, we are healed, we are whole. With our very next thought, we can claim that health and that wholeness. I am healed, whole and healthy. I relax and visualize. I am healed, whole and healthy. I am well, I am well. I am healed, whole and healthy.
Come on back. Now we're going to feel this one. We know that singing is like praying twice. So when we sing this, we can feel ourselves literally shift towards healing and wholeness. We can think of somebody that may need that. And we're going to sing these last two. I know it's an unfamiliar song, but we're going to really go for it. Angels are watching over me. I am healed, whole and healthy. I am well. I am well. I am healed, whole and healthy. I've got love surrounding me. much put your hands together I know that one was a little bit out of the recesses of what we know but you can feel that energy so as we begin to center ourselves, we're gonna start in prayer all right everybody take a deep breath close your outer eyes and as we come to that center place we know that we are healed we are whole at the very core of us, at our divine center, all is well, all is always well. We can return to that at any moment. And as we take a deep breath in and exhale, we exhale any thought that is not health, any thought or feeling that is not wholeness. And we are grateful, grateful for this time that we get to share with each other to come together in this sacred space on holy ground and share in that divinity that lies within each of us. And as we do, many New Thought churches around the country, around the world, are also celebrating healing and wholeness today. So our energy combines with that, and it goes from our hearts, extends to our community, and out into the world. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to come together and share. For this and so much more, we say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Together, thank you, God. Amen. Well, you all look beautiful today. Thank you. So on the count of three, we're going to send warm, restful wishes to Reverend Richard to the camera. Ready? One, two, three. Yes. I don't know what we're going to say. Stay home. Be healthy. We miss you. He will be back good as new this week, so we are glad to have him resting up at home. So I want to take this time to welcome anybody who might be here for the first time. If you are a first-time visitor here, we want you to raise your hand. And our ushers are going to come forward with a flower and a packet. It's nothing you have to do. We're not going to make you testify. We just really want you to put your hand nice and high so we can find you. And the rest of us are going to give a warm unity welcome. Welcome, thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning. We are so happy you could have chosen to be anywhere and you chose to be with us. Our ushers have given you a packet of information with a flower to welcome you. We have a coupon, I believe, for the bookstore and lots of information. We are a 24-7 community, so much going on here. So if you have any questions at all, after the service, you can head back to our New Beginnings kiosk and someone will meet you there to answer any of your questions or as Richard sometimes says, question any of your answers. Um, so we are just blessed to have you in our house with our family today. And downstairs afterwards, many of us will be there and we can welcome you further with some coffee and some bagels. So thank you. Um, okay, next, our resident hippie rocker. Am I allowed to call you that? <laughs> no? 
he, it's too late. <laughs> Michael March, he is just the epitome of service, the epitome of heart. He says, I'll sing whenever you need me to sing. He has become a house favorite, and he's going to take it down a notch for this first song. So please welcome on a stool, Michael March, everybody. Thank you very much. It is the evening of the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sit and watch the children play, play, yeah. Smiling faces I can see, but not for me. I sit and watch as tears go by, oh, 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 my riches can't buy everything. I want to hear the children sing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But all I hear is the sound. Of the rain falling on the ground I sit and watch as tears go by March. I love that. <laughs> Don't you love him on a soulful, a soulful uh, tune as well? Thank you so much for your service, your heart, your song. So I am going to introduce my, um, I called you comrade, what are you, my colleague, Reverend Averill. She is going to be um, taking Richard's talk and putting her own spin on, on this topic of healing and wholeness. So please welcome to the platform, Reverend Averill. Good morning, Unity North. Like Richard, like, like Richard. Hi, Richard. <laughs> this morning together, we were um, we did the first service, and we were joking. We were like, "We are Richard." It was like we were a uh, hive mind, and uh, it's nice when we can come together like this and and let Richard have that opportunity to rest and be healed and whole. So. This talk that Richard sends to us earlier in the week, it's such a gift we get to kind of peek into his mind before the sermon is delivered, especially if I'm gonna lead meditation that week, it gives me a sense of where I'm going to take the meditation and I always like to take the meditation and, and tie it in to the talk and make the talk give you an opportunity to integrate what he does on a, a cellular level. And this particular talk is very close to my home because if some of you don't know my background, but I started out teaching yoga, and in this country, yoga is, the word yoga is a homonym. 
in classic, in classic circles, in classic philosophy, the word yoga means the state of oneness that is actually attained through meditation practice. It's, it's not even the practices, it's actually the experience of the individual self dissolving into whatever we wanna call the greater mind, the greater self, the highest consciousness, God, Brahman, there's infinite names for it. It's not downward facing dog as much as I do love teaching that. And we get kind of caught up in the idea of the body and we say, oh, my body's feeling really good, but it's, it's about so much more. And we do live in a, a very body obsessive society. And you know, as a woman, especially, and as an athlete, my undergrad is exercise science. I, I've been a trainer for years. It's, it's hard not to look at this and you're also beautiful and not forget that what I'm looking at is just a fraction of what there really is as relates to who you really are. And it's not to say that the body shouldn't be treated well or cherished, but it's important to understand in the spirit of, of the interfaith spiritual center that we, we profess to be, to use the Buddhist term, the body is impermanent. It's, it's part of our story. Julie artfully said this morning, you know, we're only gonna all do two things. We're gonna be born and we're going to die. And we have to remember that everything in between is, is our story and it's, it's, it's just, it's a flash in the pan. It happens so quickly. So in every religious system, there is teaching about non-attachment to the physical experience as, I don't like the word insignificant, but just as a part of who we are. Not the essence of us, but merely the vehicle through which we learn express, grow, and experience life. And we have a lovely quote, a lovely set of quotes from the Christian tradition that are coming up. So let's say this first one together from St. Paul. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And that's from Colossians 3.2. And then we have Jesus in Matthew 6 together. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be, will also be. Well, actually, mine says be also, so I think mine is backwards. It doesn't matter. It's fun to see the editing happening in real time. And, you know, we can look at that first quote as being very nonchalant, like, oh, nothing matters, you know, but that, that's not the truth of it. That's saying earthly versus heavenly or earthly versus spiritual. Just we can really think of that as meaning temporal or, or real. We can think of it as being impermanent or transient versus heart-centered affairs. We can think of it, am I gonna really get angry about this particular situation which will change in five minutes or five years or 50 years or am I gonna stay anchored in the truth which is that I'm love and that can never be taken away from despite the situation that's outside of me. So what do all of these masters and sages and prophets have in common? Well, first of all, their focus was on the spiritual. Again, using that word meaning the greater, the higher, and not the earthly meaning the stuff that we just get caught up and stuck on. Spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. And later on, I'm going to give a couple of suggestions for developing that discernment. All of these sages, by the way, have left their body, and amazingly, their greatest impact came after that transcendence. So the truth that they offered wasn't just relegated to their, their skin suit that they were wearing. These physical suits, and in yoga, in traditional yoga philosophy, we refer to these skin suits as koshas. And we don't have a slide for that, but the word, because I know a lot of you like to take notes, is K-O-S-H-A-S. And in Vedanta, the idea is that we have five of these suits that we wear, which I think is very fascinating. We had a lot of fun with this in first service. 
The first suit that you wear as a spiritual being is the one that I see when I smile at you. And we would translate that to English saying that's your body that's made of food. And some of us made jokes about maybe they should be made of less food or maybe made of more food or, or higher quality food. But regardless, it's called Anamaya Kosha. And it means this, it's the body made of earth substance. And it's our temporary, our, it's like the clothes that I'm wearing. The next body, and if you're going to a unity church, you're probably very familiar with your chakra system or the idea of subtle energy. That next body is called prana maya kosha, and it's the body that your subtle energy flows through. It's the body that when you're sitting close to someone, you can kind of feel that electromagnetic magnetic field from them. A lot of our, our spiritual insights come from this place, but even further beyond, sometimes our illness begins in these places as well and manifests outward in the physical body. If we go in a step further, and that word that I used, kosha, by the way, means lampshade, that each one is like superimposed over the next. It doesn't mean that they're more real or less real. We're just using that for a way for you to organize it in the mind. The next one is the, the field of your mind, and we call that mana, maya kosha. And it's mental processing, like Averill is giving talk right now. Averill has to go meet a friend afterwards. Just thoughts come, thoughts go. It's normally my active conscious mind. But if you go in further, there's a place where your, your intuition comes from, and we call that your wisdom body. So now we're at number four. And that's vijana maya kosha. Um, yana means wisdom, and vijana means the source of wisdom. And the finest of your bodies, the most subtle of your body, is called ananda maya kosha, which means the body that is made of bliss. And when you recede into uh, deep, deep sleep, and it feels like your personality kind of disappears, that dreamless sleep, that we would say that you were at that level of the causal plane. But in the source, in the place of the deepest meditation, in the field where there is no separation, is there is no body, and we call that Atman, or the domain of the soul. And so all of those outer ones are built on experience and time, and, it, and, and you don't have to subscribe to the same philosophy to say that even in this lifetime, you have reincarnations. You are born, you have experiences, and then you're born again. The idea of this body is that it's supposed to be temporary, yet we put a lot of focus on healing it, tending to it, making it last longer, extending its life, and spending thousands of dollars keeping it looking good till we're 300 as if it's eternity in the end result. Well, I put a lot of effort in this as well. But it's, are we putting effort in because we're afraid of something? we're afraid to let it go? Are we putting effort in to make it strong and vibrant so that we can do great work? Do you hear the difference? Like I'm, I'm a real advocate for getting rid of the term anti-aging, as if aging was some unnatural process, as if I wasn't getting better, more wise, more amazing. I have so many more experiences that I've had now than I had 20 years ago. I think I'm much smarter, much kinder now. <laughs> I see a hand up there. As well as the fact that in many, in most indigenous cultures, who were the most revered people in the community? Our elders, the, the crone, the sage, the, the wizard. I mean, you don't get a wizard beard when you're 15, right? So there's... <laughs> There's something to that, that now we look at it like that's something we need to be afraid of. And if we think about it just intuitively, if we can, there's many different ways to view God. I've done man, different meditations with you on different expressions of God. And one form could think of, we can think of the divine as being a parent. Wouldn't that be a crazy joke that your whole parentage, you, you love your child and the, at the end it's going to be something terrible. Like I don't, I can't accept that, that death is necessarily a bad thing. We just don't know. We have ideas, we have hopes, so our fear projects it. Does that make sense? Whereas, why would that be the great equalizer? Why is every single person going to experience that and it's something horrific? So, it's really about attachment as opposed to health. 
I do treat my body well because I want to be of service. I'm trying to treat my body well because it's a treasure, but not because I'm afraid of my impermanence. So yes, sometimes, thank you. I got an amen. All right, that just made my day. Thank you, Atiba. So <laughs> as you can hear, sometimes the body responds and rids itself of impurities and said, why did you eat that cheese plate when you were in Asheville this weekend? And <laughs> sometimes it doesn't because, you know, that cheese talks to you, right? And Julie and I were talking about sometimes you listen to your body's mind and sometimes you listen to your wisdom mind. And this weekend I, I succumbed to my lower nature and ate the cheese platter. So <laughs> and now my lungs are telling me that. So our job here today is to explore the causal reality of spirit which is a wholeness, and it's untouched by any physical experience. You know, yes, my lungs are letting me know that dairy and I don't do well together, but I understand that at the core, I, I am unscathed. Who I am is never added to or subtracted from. It is, and it was from the moment that I was thought of in the mind of God. So that assures that, that live or die, and hopefully this doesn't lead to that, wholeness has already been realized. That's who I am. It cannot be added to, subtracted from, changed. My concern as a, a minister is, is more about how we meet dying than saying that there's some magic wand that is going to prevent that. And I recently had this experience with a very dear friend who people use the term you know, untimely death for. And that's a very loaded statement because this was his story. And who am I to say it was, it was untimely? He was quite young. He was 50 years old. And when I met him in, um, I'm an exercise physiologist. That was my, my job before I switched to this job. And he had a lung transplant. He had something that was very similar to cystic fibrosis. And that there's an idea that, you know, that after a transplant that you're, probably not gonna have a long physical incarnation. And about five years later on the day, he ended up getting a, a very serious fungal infection. And because of the anti-rejection medication, his body really couldn't handle it. I was told it was something that we would have probably gotten a little cold from. Well, during that five year period that he had the lung, he really took living to another level. He came here several times. He was an avid meditator. He was exercising. He was fully present. I think that, that it touched him. He understood that he was temporary. So he was making every moment heaven. And at his funeral, he had 65 best friends. I mean, everybody got up and was like, so the thing is that Kirk was really my best friend. And you don't really understand that, no, he was my best friend. And then finally, when the last guy got up, he goes, okay, I met Kirk when we were two years old. So, and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> this is what you want to know. You want to know that you had a romance with every single person that you ever encountered. That when you were with any person, that they were the only other person in the world. We have this capacity for that level of intimacy. We're just too afraid, and we put too many boxes around other people. When Kirk made his transition, he was an adopted person. He was adopted, he was an only child, and he was not married. And his adopted parents had transcended, so who he had were his friends. And he made everything so easy. He even wrote his own eulogy, which was very, very funny. We went to his service, and it was at the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers. Who here is familiar with that amazing abode? Yeah, I thought so. And he had a natural burial. So he was there, and he was in the shroud, and we were singing a cappella hymns at the gravesite, and he was covered in flowers, and we actually got to bury him. We got to pour the soil in, and it was a birth in reverse. It was, and I thought, wow. He brought all these people together, and if you knew Kirk's friends, most of them would never wear rubber boots and go to the woods in Conyers. They were fabulous divas and devos. And we were all in rubber boots, digging this. And he was, and the joke was, look, even Kirk got us all together to do this. And I thought, he has taught me something. He 
left on Palm Sunday, the day after one of his best friend's birthday, and it was just like a breath. And I said, this, this moment, this is life. This is it. He gave me composure. I realized how much as a, I was afraid, even as a minister of my transition. Well, in Buddhism, there is an idea of something called bardo. And after you leave this life, you go to this place of kind of interbeing where you're either going to be recycled or not. And the reason that most of us come back according to this theology is because we're afraid. And the kind of life that we experience has a lot to do with how afraid we were to cross that threshold. And I think there's a, a profundity in that. There's a quote that's coming up that's from Taoism, from Lao Tzu. And I'd like us to say this together. There we go. We just have to practice patience, right? They're doing a good job. I couldn't do it. Together, some lose yet gain, others gain yet lose. My prayer is that each of you gains an understanding of essence, win or lose in any outside situation. So what's the difference between wholeness and healing? So wholeness is about drawing near and connecting to source, whether you want to call it God, love, life, Atman, Tao, whether you're an agnostic and just don't even have a word or a term for it, it doesn't matter. Healing is about changing external conditions. So healing is very much about attachment, and wholeness is about remembering your true nature. We have to ask ourselves the question, is our path a transformational one, which is about changing external conditions, which is a path to suffering, or a translational path, changing ourselves in relationship to whatever is before us? The Buddha clearly taught that life will include suffering, or dukkha, okay, which kind of is a, a, a word for basic experiences that all humans will, will be subject to, aging, sickness, old age, death. Dukkha is a perpetual cycle of existence, and it's known as samsara, and that word means wandering. That's the fancy term for being reincarnated over and over again. Life after life of repeating the same fear-based mistakes. So for today, we want to let go of the idea, and we'll do this in the meditation, and just witness the way that this lifetime, we are repeating those same things over and over again. You don't have to even believe in reincarnation in another life. Those lessons are a byproduct of transform transformational focused living and not translational focused living, which breaks the cycle of suffering right then and there. So we have a quote from the Buddha. Together. All I teach is suffering and the end of suffering. It does not mean grave physical pain, but rather the mental suffering we undergo when our tendency to hold on to pleasure encounters the fleeting nature of life and our experiences become unsatisfying and ungovernable. We suffer because we are projecting the myth of permanence upon a situation that is conditioned and constantly changing. So listen to this line one more time. The tendency to hold on to pleasure the tendency to hold on to pleasure. So who here feels like they should not ever be stuck in traffic? Okay. Who feels like they should not suddenly have a water main break in their, right. Who feels like they should not stub and break their toe? Right, okay. Who feels like they should not have someone they love die very suddenly without them being able to plan for it? Okay. Who feels like the government should stay stable or instable, right? Who feels like who they want to win running for office should win? So that word, what's the one word I keep using? 
So who, who is the should? Where, where did this cosmic justice come from that you're expecting, right? That, that's attachment. And it's okay because we all do it. I get in the car and there's a part of my mind when I'm driving to work that absolutely feels like I should get to work in a reasonable amount of time. Now, I, I really need to have a conversation with that part because it's like, come on now, girlfriend. Like, when have you ever gotten anywhere in Atlanta in a reasonable time? But there's still this inkling that one day this unicorn is going to drive me to work and there's never going to be any traffic. But we kind of do this all the time. The truth is there's no should, there's no promise, there just is what it is. And every moment that things go pleasantly is really just like a gift and a miracle, right? That's really, we should have gratitude that we had a good day. But there's attachment, and, and that's okay. You know, we're, we're egoic creatures. When you're, when you're born and you choose to take a body in this lifetime, this is one of the things that we learn. We're all going to experience pain. And, and some people have lives that have a lot more pain than others, but the more that we can get the sense that pain is a unifying experience, which first of all does not mean that pain and evil are the same thing. Pain is a vehicle for compassion. Now that I look at my life and I say, wow, I'm experiencing this pain, when I see someone else's pain, it is supposed to motivate me to want to alleviate that suffering, to connect with that person as opposed to just make, it's my pain, it's my pain, it's my pain, and should, 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 should. Our job on the quest for healing is to break this cycle. And the only way to break the cycle is to turn our attention from the realm of effects to the realm of cause within. And we become more concerned with cures than healing. So we have a quote from my favorite uh, Sufi mystic Rumi. Maybe, oh, together. Maybe you are searching among the branches for what only appears in the roots. The cures we are seeking are in the healing and the wholeness in the roots of consciousness. So we have been given these beautiful tips from Richard to find healing, and they're going to come up in a moment. And, and it's from a, a variety of faith traditions. It says all world traditions, and I laugh, but there's so many that we just don't even know. But it's, it's, there's something to the fact that in most traditions, and most studied traditions, these are commonalities. These are, we are all the same. We all have suffering, and we're all trying to figure out how can we ameliorate and transcend. So if we can go to the next slide. The first recommendation is to turn within to a higher power. And unity is a pluralistic tradition. We say there's many paths, one God. Many paths to source. Many paths to experience the divine, and we respect them all. So your tradition might say to turn it over to Jesus, or your tradition might say to surrender to God. But as an agnostic or an atheist, you can also surrender to service. That's a higher power. We can all get out of our own way without making it submitting to something that's external. Remember I talked a moment, about, a, a moment ago about how our pain can be a vehicle to compassion. So service is a way that we can turn to a higher power, the higher power of taking care of humanity. So we can take the focus off the misery of our particular situation and take it to something greater. In the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, it teaches us to shift our attention from claiming our suffering as our own and bringing the awareness that it is God's suffering because it is unable to express through us. Open the portal for us to be a healer rather than to be healed. I was very fortunate maybe two weeks ago to be part of the Wednesday communion before Easter. Who was here for that? And we came up and we did a blessing. And I think I got to bless maybe 20 people, 25 people that day. And I was euphoric for days afterward. Every time I got to offer a blessing, I was also receiving a blessing. It was so apparent to me that there is no one direction. It's a complete, continuous flow. And, and I was like, wow, look at my karma. Look at my fortune. 
I got to do that. I got to participate in that. I got to be present to this love and just to share it with these 25 people. And every, tw every better person who came up, they were my best friend. <laughs> I got two amens. This is a two amen talk. <laughs> so the second recommendation is prayer slash meditation. And I really appreciate that because as an interfaith advocate, you know, those are our, our heavy words. I would even compel us to add another slash and say, just going inside, coming apart for a while, going into the sanctuary of your heart, whichever door brings you in there, because there isn't one right way to become still and silent. So we have another quote. You do not have to say this person's name, but I practice now. <laughs> Siddhi Singh Sahib Harbhajan Singh Khalsa Yogiji. <laughs> Let's do this one together. Self-healing is not a miracle, nor is self-healing a dramatization of the personality as though you could do something superior. Self-healing is a genuine process of the relationship between the physical and the infinite power of the soul. It is a contract, a union. When a person prays, he slash she is extending himself outside, but the reaction is actually happening inside. You may pretend you are praying to the heavens, but actually you are changing yourself inside. You are changing yourself inside. You realize you're the one that moves. You realize that it's not the spoon that bends, it's you. I just revealed my age because I love that movie so much. <laughs> So the third, if you can go to the next slide, the third recommendation is forgiveness. And that should be a completely intuitive one for everyone in this room. When you are harboring resentment, you are the one who is suffering. Sitting up at night and wishing something bad could happen through space and time to someone who may even not even be alive. Who is the one who is wasting that energy, wasting that power, wasting that time? We are all connected, but you're also <laughs> connecting to your own self. Those thoughts aren't just going out there. It's a circle. You are punishing yourself when you are stewing in hatred. It, and, and there are some arguments, and I tread on this very lightly because I think that sometimes in new thought circles, it can sound like we're like, oh, what did you do to cause your illness? Or what do you do to cause your illness? And I know people who have been really subject to that spiritual malpractice before, but there is evidentiary support that our mind state and our physical state are linked together. And the first thing I talked about was those koshas. Well, one is subtler than the next, and the subtler ones pervade outward. So in the mind, which is inside the energy, which is inside the body, if there is negative thought, there is more likely to be manifested a physical experience of illness, okay? So it's not saying that if someone is sick, what did you do last night? What negative thoughts were you thinking? But there is a correlation. Sometimes there are other things in play. The last recommendation is to know oneness. And although that sounds a lot like one and two on the list, that we're using that word a little bit differently. We're gonna use that word to mean non-attachment. I talked about attachment before with the word should, which when I work with my patients, I say, you gotta get that should out of your language because should really nice people live forever and really, really mean people not? I mean, sure, should, you can should all you want, but this is the reality. <laughs> Knowing oneness means operating from the heart, mind, and soul with the infinite, aligning them together. It shows up as, shows up as all of creation. You can be in a painful experience and be at one with it if you let go of the idea that it should not be happening to you. Do you believe that the mind of God is much smarter than the mind of our individual experience? Yes or no? Do you believe that the divine, whatever you want to call it, is infinitely intelligent? Do you really believe that it's omniscient? 
which means it can see everything, past, present, future, every, every corner of the multiverse, right? So if something is happening that you're perceiving is bad to you, how could those two ideas coexist, right? It knows more than we know at this moment. So when we can be in a negative situation, a painful situation, it doesn't mean we concede. It doesn't mean if we don't see that, if we see someone treated poorly, we don't rise up. But there's a difference with should and attachment and being motivated from love. Do you hear the difference, yay or nay? Okay. So embrace what you feel powerless in rather than fighting it. So everything that we experience is a symbol of something greater, whether it's when we're looking for healing, whether it's a doctor and a prescription or a dance or a religious ritual, it's all symbolic of an inner desire, knowing and shift, whether it's prayer and meditation or acupuncture or Reiki or massage or crystals or mantras or surgery, eating differently and exercising, which you can do all here at this spiritual center, by the way. It is a symbolic of inner knowing, all used as an avenue to return home to the homeostasis of the body, mind, and spirit. So I want to conclude with a quote from the Grand Dame of Unity, Myrtle Fillmore, and let's say this together. I am a child of God, therefore, I do not inherit sickness. Thank you. I got three amens, and I got an amen from Sylvia. Oh, yay. Oh, you guys made my day. I'm going to be just even more euphoric than when I got to do the uh, communion. So we're going to take this into my favorite part, the time of meditation. We are. And um, thank you. That was amazing. We have a hand for Reverend Abraham. We decided at first service we make a pretty good team because I'm like the humor to the intellect, which you know, I, I'm smart too, but I, I inserted a lot of humor into this subject. But, you know, she's absolutely right. We, we, um, we don't inherit sickness and we are all as well. And so the song that we, we're going to sing is May All Beings Know Love. And after hearing the talk, I think it takes on an even deeper meaning. So I'm going to invite you to sing along with us and the words... May all beings know love. May all beings know peace. And then we go into no more pain. We can sing that from an attachment to the pain because, like she said, it's you can have pain without suffering because things are going to happen that hurt. So we can sing that from the depths of our being, knowing that within any physical or mental pain, there does not have to be the attachment of suffering. And this is an ancient Buddhist prayer, by the way. Loka samasta suki no bhavantu. So you can sing it in that language, too.
invite you to close your outer eyes. As we take a meditation and exploration through our koshas, be aware of the body. The most gross, the most exterior, the most objective of the lampshades. Feel your body. In the stillness, still feel your body. Feel your feet grounded on the floor. Feel your bottom supported by the chair. Feel your hands, your neck, your head, your whole body. Be aware of your body. In a moment of non-judgment, not evaluating I like or dislike, but just truly being aware of being embodied. Have a sense at this moment that regardless of your perception of illness or health, age, sex, whatever, whatever descriptors we use, that your body is perfect. Because Atman, the light of the divine, projects through all of the shades and becomes your body. Remain in that space. Then bring your, your awareness inward into the breath. And all the, the breath is a physical experience. The breath flows through subtle currents and cross currents in our energy field. So as you inhale, feel the air passing through your nostrils. As you exhale, feel it flowing through those nasal passageways. And as it comes into the body, feel it just kind of vanish and have a sense that it's pervading every inch of you. As you exhale, bring your awareness from the top of your head down to the base of your spine. And as you inhale, let the awareness of this breath energy rise from the base of the spine to the top of the head as we are now anchored in our second, our more subtler kosha, the kosha where the chakras are housed, our pranic field. Exhaling from the top of the head down to the base of the spine and inhaling from the base of the spine to the top of the head. And some people visualize the breath as something like a thin and milky white stream. Some people see nothing. Some people feel a coolness and a tingliness. Some people feel nothing. You cannot do this wrong. But for the next few moments of silence, stay with this subtle descending and ascending breath. Breathing at your own pace, exhaling down, inhaling up. And then we take a step inward, a step inward to the screen of the mind. It helps to look as if you were peering into your own forehead. And just with eyes closed, in your mind's eye, noticing how the mind is almost ceaseless. Thoughts come and go, come and go. Maybe you're thinking about what you're going to do when you leave. Maybe you're thinking about what you did five years ago. Maybe you're liking, disliking, bored, sleepy, interested, blissed. It doesn't matter, but just notice there is mental processing. And having a sense that it's neither positive nor negative, having a sense of gratitude for the ability to think. Just remain in that space for a moment, just noticing the screen of your mind. This is the wisdom 
the mind body, the mind body. Now continue to focus on this stream. Noticing now with a little discernment that some of the thoughts in our mind field bring us closer to peace. They're thoughts of love, oneness, connection, compassion. Some of our thoughts bring us into duality, judgment, condemnation, separation. Notice the duality in our beautiful mind. For a moment, just notice pleasant, unpleasant, like, dislike, closer, further. The ability to discern these comes from your wisdom body. It's a place of intuition. Then I want you to bring your awareness one more time back to your breath. And I want you to focus on the feeling of the breath in your heart. And as you inhale and exhale, and you stay very anchored in this space, it's like the mind is a little bit outside of you now, flowing with its currents and cross currents. It's pleasant and it's unpleasant. The breath is in the heart and that feeling of safety, of peace, of calm is the energy of your bliss body. Now, we go into the silence. And as you go into the silence, have a sense that the thoughts, the breath, the body are all exterior to who you are, which is nestled, but shining bright as that light within your heart. Remain in that space. Observe the silence that is the center of consciousness. Remain aware of that. Then reflect on the relative quietness of the mind. In between the thoughts is that silence in the heart, the light of who you are. Remain aware of it as you notice the smoothness of your breath. Remain aware of the center that is the truth as you one more time feel the stillness of your body. Remain aware of it, remain aware of it as you gently open your eyes and bring it back with you. And I thought that was so beautiful. I'd like to ground that in by singing that song again and carrying the power of that meditation, the power of the breath, the power of the presence, the power of that healing and wholeness through every cell, through every breath. We can do that through song. 
You can hold in mind someone that you want to affirm that wholeness for, knowing that within any physical pain there is that wholeness. So let's go ahead and sing one more time. May all beings know love. for us to gather our gifts and that's one more our God energy our green energy and as a as you get your gift and your offering the ushers come forward we hold that close to our heart and if you're a consistent giver and we really hope that you will consider being part of our consistent giving program especially going into the summer months um, having this card and being on a consist consistent giving while you guys are off on vacation ensures that we can have that consistent giving and know that we can do what we need to do for this facility. So you can always sign up for that and we appreciate it. You can also give via text now. So we're in the 21st century and going beyond. So at any time during the service, we're hoping at some point you can pay for classes this way, but you can uh, give via text. You just text the Unity North and the amount to that number and click on the link the first time. So. As you gather your gift, or if you're paying by phone, put your phone against your chest, I suppose, and let us, uh, no, don't do that. That might be harmful. Don't do that. <laughs> don't, cancel, cancel clear. Um, <laughs> go ahead, and we're going to recite our offering blessing, knowing that the intention is that we're, yeah, hold your phone like this, press down, press together, stir it up, and expand it out into the community and into the universe. So we recite together, I am so blessed, I am so prosperous. And it is my great pleasure to share of my prosperity and to share of my blessings. And in the giving, the entire world is blessed. Thank you, God. Amen. And as the baskets come around, we affirm that through our song, as we do, with uh, I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed. Together, I am so to have a rockin' tune this time, I think, from our uh, resident, this yeah, is official. Yeah, I faked you out with the first one. He did. Our this resident one, hippie rocker, Michael March. Go ahead and tell us about it. I have a special guest that I'd like to come up and help me. He's going to give us an official unity dance lesson. I believe that would Atiba. be Atiba. Come on up. Woo! <laughs> Atiba and Michael March, let's get it going. I love our band. Can't wait forever. 
Even though you want me to No, I can't wait forever To know if love is true Time won't let me Burdick, I know you're watching while the cat's away. <laughs> Look, we got to honor that. That is some soul right there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. That was a lot of fun. It was what? Wholeness at its best. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to bring it down and we're going to have Carol pray over our gifts. Hello, everyone. We wanted to let you know that after the service, we'll be over by the kiosk or in that area. And we'll to offer prayer for you if you need it. Let us take a few moments now. Close our outer eyes if you choose and drop down to your heart space, affirming the truth of our abundance, being grateful for the abundance and the giving of our tithes and offerings that, that you have so blessed this community with. And with this blessing, we are able to do all the work that is ours to do and in return bless the community, the nation, and the world. Now let us focus on these prayers affirming that we are whole, we are healed. Every prayer in this box is answered. All is well, right in perfect order for every prayer expressed today. We are grateful. Thank you, God. And so it is. And so it is. And I was just thinking during that prayer how blessed we really are. You know, from pitch hitting with Avril and myself when Richard's gone, to a band who plays James Brown when Atiba comes up, to a man who donates his time to rock out with us. That is the definition of wholeness. And I want to give a special recognition to the people up there because we don't always do that, but they are working their little tushies off. Michael on sound, Wes on slides. Give them some love up there. April, Meta Bear, Iris, I don't know who's up there today, Matt. We couldn't do what we do without them, and so they deserve some love, because man, I was making Wes run today. So um, on your feet if you can. We're gonna end with another song. We don't do much that often, but I am blessed. 
blessed always. This is uh, Ricky Byers. And we know that we are, so join hands across the aisle. And let's raise our voices. Blessed always. so much. Thank you, Reverend Averill. I believe the first, thank you. I believe the first meeting of soup is today. Carrie will be leading that. We'll see you downstairs for some fellowship. If not, we'll see you next week. Thank you.